Welcome to Well Behaved Women. Hello. Hi. Hi. Our lives are falling apart. How are yours? (laughs) Yeah, it's fine. Uh, My name's Curia. I am joined by Lauren Schill. Hello. Um, We are your hostesses with the messesses. There we go. (laughs) I'm not going to say mostess. We just have mess. (laughs) No, we just are hot messes and that's that's how we come prepackaged. Welcome. Welcome. This, I don't know if you guys will hear this during Pride Month, but welcome to this Pride Month edition of Well Behaved Women. I wanted to do it in like three parts. Um, okay. So we're going to be kind of late with the recording for the other two parts. Okay. Obviously, it will have already passed, but I wanted to get this one out at least before we do Pride on Saturday. Gary is so excited. He has these accidentally gay pants. But he got it. <laughs> Goodwill. And they're like these gray slacks. And then when you turn up the cuffs, they're rainbows. Fun. He loves them. He was like, can I wear these to pride? I was like, you're going to burn up. He goes, well, then I just won't wear a shirt. I'm like, Are Yeah. I was about to be like, has he checked the weather? <laughs> like, it's going to be hot. I know. Miserable. Yeah. I'm, I'm wearing a dress like I always do to things. It's one piece of clothing. And then I don't have to think about it anymore. At clothing. At clothing. So our first person for our special Pride Month highlight. Yeah. Da, 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 da. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I told Gary that I do that every episode because he has he still hasn't listened to the show. I told Gary that I do that every episode and why do our I, partners hate us and our creative <laughs> agent, adventure? <laughs> Whatever. It's he doesn't have to like it. It no, I know that's fine. But and he hears enough of it when I'm talking about it. I'm like, did you know this and that and the other thing? And he's like, yes, dear, I knew. <laughs> he, um, I was doing research for this and we went to Nine Pound and he was mm-hmm. like, I pro- he's like, I'm going to just sit there on the other side of the booth and I'm going to mind my own business. And he did. He played on his phone and we ran into Edward and um, like he came and sat with us while we were having dinner. And so we kind of hung out with him. And then he like left us alone and I just sat at the bar and did my research and did my (laughs) typing and Gary like played on his phone and just hung out. It was honestly a very sweet date. Oh, fun. (laughs) Yeah. I love having just like a person be present while I'm doing stuff. It was really nice of him to offer and just be like, I'm going to be there for company. And like we knew if, if Edward showed up, like, you know, we kind of have to like shoo him away at some point and so he was like we'll just be there as a buffer when edward shows up which he did which was i mean i always love seeing him but is he just like another regular he is um he and i uh were you around when i got the christmas book the book from the dude that i went on like four dates with maybe I don't know if I remember this. Okay, Reader's Digest version. This guy I met at Halloween had like four to six dates with him over the course of like two months. Mm -hmm. And at Christmas, he got me this bouquet of roses, of of flowers. Mm -hmm. And he made this like book. And I've seen a bunch of um, advertisements for it, like a love book or whatever, or love story, something like that. Oh, okay. It was really adorable he got my hair color right because at the time it was like the purple and the teal Uh it was like god if if we had been dating maybe eight months i would have understood it yeah absolutely (laughs) that's a cute at a at a different point in our relationship (laughs) our relationship exactly yeah (laughs) but no right now it's fucking creepy as hell oh no Um, it was a lot of commitment and i was really not a fan so (laughs) sure so I left his apartment and I was like, I need a drink. <laughs> so I went to nine pound and I sat down and I came in and I didn't know what to do. I was, I still had these two fucking things in my hand. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I hand the bouquet of flowers to the door guy and I'm like, I got you flowers. And he's like, that's really sweet. And he actually like went and got a pitcher of water and put them by Aww. the door. It was really cute. It's this stingy, dingy, like low lit bar. Yeah. With never flowers <laughs> would ever exist in there, but it was like this cute little thing right at the door and you got to enjoy them all night. And then I have this book and I was showing the bartenders 
and then this ass hat in like 1900 garb um with like the hat with like the bowler hat kind of thing and this like a steampunk dude kind of yeah okay. was sitting next to me and was like well what you got there and i was kind of just in a jovial mood and it, it was like a all right fucking buy me around and i'll tell you and so he did i would didn't i didn't think he would take me seriously but he did um so i tell him this story and the guy that's sitting on the other side of him edward is also okay. kind of listening in. And so I'm showing them this book that's like going through just, I like your smile. I like when you go out on dates. I like, it was really funny when we went to the museum, like it was so sweet, but Oh my God. Yeah. It was, early. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, and they're so. laughing at this. Like, this is kind of, this is a funny thing. You know, the bartenders have had a good chuckle at it. I actually think I left it at the bar. Um, <laughs> but then this steampunk dude is like sitting there and because he, I have bought myself two more rounds by this time. So like it, he's not, it's not like he's been plowing me with that. Um, he won't leave me alone. And then he kind of starts hitting on me and I'll like go outside for a few minutes and he'll, yeah come out with me and then I'll go back inside and Edward could kind of see what was going on Mm -hmm. and then there was one point at which this steampunk ass fucking oh I wish I'd have the courage to punch him I really wish I had he was like I'd like to see what that dress looks like that flipped over your head like oh my god and so Edward just stepped right in and kind of like acted as the buffer and then I saw him a few nights later and Mm. just kind of every once in a while we're at there at the same time so it's you know it's nice to run into him and then it was like one of the first people that I saw at the bar when we actually when it opened up again when it reopened yeah oh good and it's like he's kind of one of Gary's only friends here Mm -hmm. which is sad but we also have no social life so it makes sense yeah uh like eric is one of donald's only friends here (laughs) and he is alex's husband so yeah that's kind of a weird dynamic yeah whatever teacher but like alex or uh donald and eric get along like seriously wonderfully they both have adhd they both play baseball they like whatever they're they got they got a lot of stuff to talk about yeah that's good. Okay. <laughs> On this year in history, the Soviet forces liberate the Lods ghetto and only 877 Jews of the initial population of 164,000 remain. The future Queen Elizabeth II joins the army, the auxiliary territorial services as a truck driver. So she was actually a mechanic. Yeah. Until she became queen, which is so cool. We're going to do an episode on her at one point. They also allude to it in The Crown. I know, which I love. She's like always in the engine, like kind of, all right, let's see what's going on here. Um, Roosevelt dies, leaving Truman in charge. On April 20th, Hitler leaves his bunker for the last time as a birthday celebration, marries his mistress nine days later, and signs his last will and testament. They would be married for one day and then commit suicide together. Good fucking riddance. While he appointed Joseph Goebbels as his successor, Joseph and his family would be dead by the next night, choosing to kill his four children and commit suicide with his wife, and appointing Schwerin von Krossig as the new mm-hmm. chancellor. And if I fuck that up, I don't give a shit. We don't care. We, we don't care. emphasize the amount that we don't care. Seven days later, the war in Europe has officially ended. And... Marsha P. Johnson was born as Malcolm Michaels Jr. on 20, the 24th of August, 1945. Welcome to the world, Marsha. She's here. So um, just kind of as a like a precursor to this, we're talking about a trans woman. Well, not a trans woman, and we'll get into that later on. Mm-hmm. But I will switch back and forth from pronouns a lot. And it's going to be um, according to like the identity at the time of that specific story. Okay. And we'll kind of get into like talking about why yeah, sure. not an, like that, why that answer is not nearly as simple as one or the other. Okay. 
So Malcolm was one of six children born to Malcolm Sr. in Elizabeth, New Jersey. He was a line worker at General Motors, and Alberta, his mother, was a housekeeper. They were devoutly religious, and the entire family would attend African Methodist Episcopal Church, flirt with Catholicism a little bit, and they would keep private altars in the family home, which I actually didn't know was a thing. Like, I I thought that was more of a... I I thought that was more of like a Roman Catholic thing for... Yeah. What um, kind of... Like, did they have anything at the altar, or was it just... Or like... mm, I think it was, was it to God? Like was it an altar like, to like maybe like a altar big to Big G Jesus? God? Okay, that's what I was wondering. I was like, was it an altar to like Big G God or? Well, it's AMF, AMEC, so the Episcopals, and then Catholicism, so both Christians. So I would yeah, imagine okay. like it's it's a Christ. Malcolm, as a child, took an interest in women's clothing, oh. and at five years old, he started wearing dresses, which oh. is fucking adorable. Yeah. So it's unknown how long the, they were able to enjoy this before boys in the neighborhood do what all li- shitty little boys do, and they made fun of Malcolm. So they stopped. Mm-hmm. And around this young age, Marsha would later describe being sexually assaulted by one of the teenage boys in the area. Mm-hmm. It, it's going to suck boys. how much we're going to talk about sexual assault in this show. It's just it is. I kind of a, everyone goes through it. It's just a reality of being a woman. Yeah, it's it's really terrible, but I, I think it's uh, super common that we do have to talk about it because we cover so many women in this show. And it's always a thing, and it's always abused. Be there's always <laughs> going to be there's always going to be a moment in every woman's life where they're assaulted or raped or harassed or whatever because of the fact that they don't have a dick between their legs, and that's yeah, yeah. fucked up. It's terrible. <sighs> All right. Not a lot is known about Marsha's early life, except that basically there was this clear attitude in their home, very conservative Christian home, that when it came to being different, it was just not acceptable. Uh, His mother, Alberta, would say that being a homosexual was like being lower than a dog. Jesus. Yeah. It should come as no surprise then that Malcolm made the choice to be celibate until they left home. Being gay had become some sort of pipe dream for him and not something that could be realized in their lifetime at all. Mm -hmm. Which is very upsetting. Yeah, that's awful. When Malcolm graduated at 17, they moved to Greenwich Village in in New York City. New York City. New York City. Center of the universe. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know. Now I want to go watch Rent. Bye. Yeah. (laughs) Life sure is shitty. Yeah. But we're pretty sure it can't get worse. Um, They had with them a black bag of clothing, $15, and the pipe dream that at some point they could be out and live their life. They waited tables, and they started getting involved with the LGBTQ community in the area. In this new circle of friends and chosen family, Malcolm had the opportunity to have others see them as they always saw themselves. So they started going by the name Black Marsha. Love that. That's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about Greenwich Village for a bit. Okay. I don't know how much you know about it, but I knew zero about it. Uh, following a pretty gay borough, if I remember yep. correctly. Okay. Pretty much Bohemia of New York. Mm-hmm. So following World War One, there was a kind of exodus to this area. It started to grow a reputation for being a sizable community for the LGBTQ community with short-haired women and long-haired men. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Prohibition of the 20s and 30s helped to insulate that community and let it grow underground as speakeasies became places revered for their immoral nature anyway. Mm -hmm. We're going to hell in a handbasket. Let's do it. Do it with a with a twist. The speakeasies Mm -hmm. were um, immoral areas. People like could actually live their own lives there. And yeah. the person across sitting across from you was also just as much a piece of shit in the community as you were. So it didn't really matter. Right. Like the draw of, of them was like, everybody here is a deviant. Okay. Yes, exactly. So, so you, we all are united in this deviancy, which means that you're safe and I'm safe. So it, this neighborhood in Manhattan remained this sort of bohemian paradise. And, it became the incubator for countless artists and poets in their search for inspiration. 
It was the uh, what was that neighborhood in the Moulin Rouge? Uh, was it not the revolution? I have no idea. Was that not the neighborhood? I guess not. Maybe not. I don't know. I thought it was like, come on down to the Moulin Rouge, but maybe Moulin Rouge was in a neighborhood. I don't know much about it. I've only seen the movie once. And oh, that's a shame. That is honestly just, it's so fucking great. It's very silly. Ewan McGregor can sing. Um, it's one of Donald's favorite musicals. And uh, he is the one who showed it to me the first time. I just, I didn't go back and revisit it. Like it was great. I just didn't yeah. go back for it. But yeah. You're also really not a movie person anyway. I'm not, but um if like the more music is included in the movie, the chances mm-hmm. I've seen it go up like exponentially. Good. So, <laughs> That's good. Like rent, all the pitch perfects, like pretty of much course. it's like musically leaning, totally. Most of the time. Same. If it's a musical something, like, that's pretty much the reason I need to see it. Yeah. So, by the early 60s, Mayor Robert Wagner Jr. decided to go on a full anti-gay campaign in the run-up to the 1964 World's Fair. He engaged his officers in all sorts of shit undercover, mostly going into gay bars and busting the men inside and revoking the liquor licenses of the bar involved. But there were other accounts of flirting with men on the street, seducing them, and then when the men would fall for it because they think they're in a safe spot, they're arrested for solicitation. Is that not entrapment? Oh, it's totally entrapment, but come on. Like, is New York PD? Yeah, the gay people aren't people, I guess, so you can't entrap them. Gay people aren't people. What are you talking about, Kiria? Please don't take this out of context. <laughs> no one yeah. take our quotes out of context. No problem. one take that and run with it. No. All right. The bars that accepted gays in the area were almost exclusively owned by the mafia. They watered down the drinks. They treated the customers like crap. They let the buildings they owned break down. But they also paid off the local cops so that the raids were less frequent and less intense. The liquor laws of the time prohibited bartenders to knowingly serve alcohol to a gay person. So there was a little bit of insulation there. And cops would come they would pick up their what was called, quote, the gayola. That's yeah. Jesus. Yeah. So they would pick up their gayola and then they would wait for another night to raid the bar or raid it earlier in the evening so that there weren't nearly as many people around. Jeez. And as happen with, happens with far too many poor children and desperate people of color, Black Marsha needed a way to pay her bills. So she started working on the streets. Okay. Her crowd hung around Howard Johnson's on 6th Avenue and 8th Street. Marsha would go on to say later that there in her new home, she came out. And from then on, she said, quote, my life has been built around sex and gay liberation, being a drag queen, end quote. And she was also really advocating for sex work. Yeah. She would go on to be arrested over a hundred times for sex work cross-dressing, and yeah. numerous health-related issues. Wow. Um, I just realized that I do a lot of facial expression. <laughs> when you're looking at yourself in a camera, you're like, oh. Well, I do a lot of facial expression uh, in response to, like, things that you're saying, um, mm-hmm. which is not helpful in a podcast format. So. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Almost exclusively not. This is where we're going to talk complicated. <laughs> Marsha has been labeled as many things, transgender, drag queen, gender nonconforming, gay, and transvestite, Mm -hmm. plus a few more that I, those were the most common. In general, I think the fact that they themselves identified as a drag queen, gay, and a transvestite tends to lend toward the continuous identification, at least on some level, with the male part of her. Okay. Okay. So, because drag queens are not necessarily, do not always identify as women. Oh, yeah. They identified as gay. Okay. You're a gay man. Um, Transvestite, I'm specifically cross-dressing. Okay. Without without accepting that identity. Mm -hmm. Her good friend, Sylvia Rivera, Mm -hmm. insisted on the term transvestite, which is what she and Marsha were most popularly known as. Okay. 
And Sylvia made really good points to that end in an essay she wrote called Transvestites, your half sisters and half brothers of the revolutions. Quote, transvestites are homosexual men and women who dress in clothes of the opposite sex. End quote. Okay. According to her description in an interview with Alan Young in 1972, a transvestite is still like a boy, very man looking, manly looking, an effeminate boy. Okay. So Johnson distinguishes this from transsexual, specifically defining transsexuals as those who are on hormones and getting surgery. By the way, I'm not hurt. Like as a personal opinion, call yourself whatever you want. I don't give a shit. I'm talking definitions here solely. Well, and definitions Um, from, from this person's perspective, Yes, from this person's perspective, which is also not necessarily the standard. Right. Also discussed are um, Johnson's experience of the dangers of working as a street prostitute in drag and Johnson's husband who was murdered. Oh, geez. Yeah. Johnson and Rivera's interviews and writings in this era also at times used terminology in ways that were sarcastic and like just being camp. Okay. And also at other times were serious or, you know, everything at once. Like it, it, so it was kind of hard to figure out when they were using it seriously and when they were using it in jest. Okay. Yeah. So although Marsha was the far dominant side of her personality, there was very much still a large man active in her mind, and he stayed active throughout Marsha's life. Okay. Her friends said it was like this schizophrenic switch that would turn. Interesting. In certain situations, and the sweet, loving, saintly Marsha would turn into Malcolm. And he appeared when Johnson's angry, violent side would emerge when Johnson was depressed or really under severe stress. Mm -hmm. And when Malcolm was around, um, her friends said he would become a very nasty, vicious man. Uh, He would look for fights. Johnson's voice would lower into a deep register whenever Malcolm came out. Mm -hmm. So interesting. It is. It's really crazy. By 1966, Marsha was living on the streets, engaging in survival sex, and had formed her name that we all know pretty well right now, Marsha P. Johnson. The Johnson was based on Howard Johnson's that she hung around when she was working. And she added the P, and I love this, she added the P because she was asked so frequently for her gender information, and this was always her response. Pay it no mind. (laughs) I love that. Mm hmm. The P stands for pay it no mind. She was a very well known transvestite in the area, but because she was homeless, she did not engage in what some would call high drag or show drag, which is kind of what we all know for like RuPaul and shit. Oh, okay. Right. She slept under the tables that were used for sorting flowers in the market there in Manhattan. So she usually had a fresh flower crown on her head. She picked them from the leftovers. She liked shiny clothing and she would wear really, she would wear red plastic high heels and brightly colored wigs. What a, just a festive presence. And she was like tall, right? Super tall. She would drape this long, long, lithe body in like flowing robes and just shiny dresses and flowers. Yeah, just really, really like cheesed it up yeah so was like, living her best life like campy glamour yeah campy glamour exactly which was also why it was kind of hard to show the difference yeah elsewhere in the nation sure <laughs> all right i'm gonna take a big breath before this i'm gonna say all of these things are going to be relevant for the next three episodes oh, okay I'm not going to go through these quite as bulleted bulleted and short as I normally do because the late 60s was a huge fucking clusterfuck of problems and fallout and activism and that kind of created this political turmoil, Mm -hmm. uh, just like a little soup of tension. And so in order to fully understand all of the subversive and unspoken feelings of the time to just kind of get an idea for the, like the attitude. You actually have to know exactly all of the shit that's going on around the world. Okay. So here we go. In the fifties, there was this huge general of uh, general fear of communism. So we dealt with the McCarthy era of investigating anyone in suspicion of being un-American. Right. 
and basically ruining the careers of countless people in the search to root out any possible weak links in government work. Yes. They had been fighting with spy infiltration from the Russian government for years, and this was just another way that they could root out anyone that was not normal. This largely included the LGBT community, as it was an overt threat to outing them and putting them in danger of facing a hugely homophobic public. Right. By the early 60s, the scare had largely died down due to new activist movements that demonstrated against the tactics of the HUAC, which is called the House Un-American Activities Committee. They were the scary people in the 50s and 60s that were like there to just root out all of the commies. The secret Russians that were everywhere. Um, Russian sleeper agents. Right. JFK fucks up in Cuba and he spends the rest of his life, the next three years, kind of regretting that. Uh, right. Things are getting heated in Vietnam and more people are being sent over to Vietnam in a war that we basically came in as the third party. Right. When Johnson takes his place after he gets shot in the fucking head, he <sighs> runs his next election. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, Johnson is one of my least favorite presidents. <laughs> Uh, y- yeah, you're not going to like him anymore after I get through with all of this. Oh, I bet. Him. Oh, he's, he's a terrible awful. human. Yeah. When Johnson takes his place, he runs his next election campaign on the promise of trying to de-escalate things over there and end the tensions. He mm-hmm. wins in a landslide and he spends the next four years sending hundreds of thousands of Americans over to Vietnam to reap pillage, plunder, and murder countless Vietnamese. Indeed, he did. (laughs) So bothered by it. God damn it. (laughs) We're just as... as, He was a bad, bad person. Four black kids sat at a white-only booth in a restaurant, refused to leave, and started the spark of the civil rights era. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. In this, we have Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, the March in Selena, or in Selma. Selena. My eyes have not been working for quite some time. James Meredith is ro- enrolling in Ole Miss. Um, he's the very first black person to enroll in the school, and it just causes all sorts of chaos. Um, we've got the Watts race riots, the realization that there are just a shit ton of black people out in the world that deserved to in aid specifically in the U S that deserve to be treated with the basic respect that one should have for all living people. Johnson in this time signs in the voting rights act, the civil rights act, and he signs the Medicare bill for all his issues. There are some things that he does well but yeah. not without immense pressure from all of the people that were fucking around him. He just bumbles up Vietnam. So I was just, uh, exactly. Jesus, Jesus Christ. Okay. All right. So now we have the pill. This is invented in 1960. This starts taking the conversation about contraceptives into the public eye and it gives mm-hmm. power to women. It, it takes it out of the bedroom and actually gives the conversation to women in the public. Right. It starts with married women only being able to get it, but doctors are very quick to adapt to the realistic needs of patients. Mm-hmm. So by 1965, that was a readily available option if you knew the right doctor. If you didn't, you had to have a reason. Mm-hmm. Betty Friedan publishes The Feminine Mystique, launching the modern feminist movement. Mm -hmm. Gloria follows not long after with the Playboy Bunny article that we talked about in that episode. The National Organization for Women is founded. And we've got, you know, seven, uh, like the, you know, late 60s, early 70s feminists that start protesting on national stages at Miss America events. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They held a counter pageants in their own to protest the exclusivity of Miss America because of the attention it brings. Pepsi Cola removes their sponsorship of that pageant, saying it no longer represents the values of American society. Oh, yeah. Big deal. Yeah. Um, But, you know, protesting doesn't work and we should all just shut up and stay in our homes, apparently. Exactly. That's how we got civil rights. Yeah, totally. That's how women got rights. Yeah, it works. Activism against the Vietnam War was growing. Teach-ins, 
sit-ins, and marches were common in the major cities to protest the atrocities happening overseas. Again, raping, pillaging, plundering, murdering, all of it. (sighs) (sighs) This cause is helped by the most trusted man in America at the time, Walter Cronkite. The most trusted man. Mm -hmm. He was in Vietnam during the aftermath of the Tet Offensive and broke this long-standing tradition for journalists. He spoke openly about his personal views on the war and saying it could only end in a bloody stalemate. Mm. He saw exactly how violent and horrible it was for everyone involved. Like the soldiers didn't give a shit who they were hurting, who they were murdering. They were just there to kill, kill, kill. Yeah. And that was it. And it was only going to end in tears. The U.S. is in a race to space with Russia, reigniting what people had hoped was a dead hatred of the red commies. All right. Gay Americans in the 1950s and 60s faced an anti-gay legal system. Mm -hmm. Early homosexual groups in the U.S. sought to prove that gay people could be assimilated into society and that they favored non-confrontational education for homosexuals and heterosexuals alike. And throughout all of this, the rising generation of the 1960s was growing out of the religious fervor of the previous decade. Kids that had been forced to grow up in church in highly judgmental and conservative communities of the post-World War II era found freedom in the counterculture movement of the late 60s. We've got the hippies. We've got the lovins. We've got Haight-Ashbury. We've got the Summer of Love. We've got Woodstock. All of the backlash. Backlash. Yeah. From extreme religious conservatism. Yeah. All in all, people were learning how to be allowed to live. Black people and women are finally asserting their rights as adults in the nation, demanding for equal pay, equal voting, and equal treatment. To date, I know none of those things actually having come to full fruition. Gay gay people were showing up and living their lives authentically in this neighborhood and creating communities that supported them. It was just a lot going on. Yeah, but it's all, it's like a lot going on, but at least in the LGBT era, it, or area, because like civil rights, Mm -hmm. like racial civil rights was the thing that had like the national stage. And so like LGBT was like had so remained underground it had was just it had, yeah like they were surviving by building small communities mm-hmm. and webs and stuff like that as and well. keeping them as small communities making sure that they stayed small and by specific means exclusive yeah and i'm going to go into a lot more of that um in of, of that type of mentality and that type of attitude um in the next couple episodes cuz okay. we're going to go through three we're going to go through three women that were all involved in this same apex event that i'm about to talk about okay um but how their lives kind of crisscrossed into this and how it built this bigger movement into mm-hmm. what we have now as the lgbt community okay So this all brings us to the night of June 28th, 1969, in a little-known mafia-owned gay bar in Greenwich Village. Stonewall Inn was one of the first gay bars to allow women and drag queens inside, and the party was hopping. In the early hours of the morning, a small group of police officers called the Public Morals Squad sent gross yeah (laughs) sorry just the idea of that existing (laughs) it's really horrible to me oh god yeah you don't know how that happened it this was just something that they did on their own like they didn't have this assignment they volunteered to do this um really quickly i'm sorry because i just i had to like pull up johnson's uh like wiki and this jumped out at me uh he was born in stonewall texas president johnson yeah, Lyndon B. Johnson was born in Stonewall, Texas. Nice. And I was, and I was like, what the hell? Because uh, seeing Stonewall in his article and in Marsh's, I was like, what's happening? There are little moments like that that just make me... <sighs> that makes me happy in the balance of the universe. It means <laughs> fucking nothing in the larger scheme of things, but it's like, it means something to us. That's kind of a cool moment. Right, yeah. Of like, fucking, it doesn't mean anything, but it's like, oh, little things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so he, just like little pieces like that sometimes. Like they just give the brain a little bit of the happy chemical. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's all about those little endorphins, baby. Mm-hmm. Dopamine. We all need it. 
All right, Stonewall, let's do it. All right. In the early hours of the morning, a small group of police officers called the Public Morals Squad sent four plainclothes officers into the Stonewall Inn to assess the situation. Okay. Like I said earlier, raids normally happened earlier in the evening or the owners were tipped off before the raids to give the customers ample time to kind of scram. Right. Keeping the extra liquor car- liquor for their bars, like in cars down the street or behind these secret panels. Every night was kind of different. And so they had to have all these contingency plans for like what might happen. This night, it was different. Yeah. Um, Can you imagine having to do all that just to like go out and have a night with your community? Yeah. It's just wild. It's it's so many layers of protection that you have to take against like like hiding your identity, hiding the identity of the people that you're trusting, yeah. hiding the identity of like what that bar actually is about. Yeah. Parking imagine like imagine walking. like a random tourist coming into that bar one night yeah. thinking, Oh, Stonewall Inn, that's just gonna be like a fun little thing. And then they get in there and they're like, Oh God, this is actually a gay bar. What yeah. if they were a fucking like really big homophobe? Yeah. It's, it's so a problem. You can't even. It's really yeah. scary. And so you kind of had to like have all of these measures put in place to protect the anonymity around it all. Mm-hmm. And th- this night you just, those fail safes broke through. Yeah. And this night it got out of hand. I am going to get more into that event itself and how the raid actually went down in the next episode. Okay. Because there are a few differing stories, but I am choosing to believe the words of the women that I'm studying. And so this is how it goes down according to that. So okay. the, the I'm going to talk a lot more about Stonewall Inn, um, like the Stonewall raid next episode, because it's going to be about the woman who started the Stonewall mm-hmm. riot. Like okay. the, the actual one who started it. Right. Marsha is largely credited with started like the, the shot glass, you know, right. heard around the world. She's largely credited with starting the Stonewall riots. But according to her own words and our next person's words, that is not actually what happened. Okay. So I, this is what I'm going to I'm going to talk about what actually happened. OK, so. <laughs> They started bringing people out in cuffs as per usual. And when the lights went up in a raid, the in normally when the lights go up in a raid, IDs are checked and anyone that didn't have an ID got arrested. Any woman um, that was dressed in less than three pieces of effeminate clothing was arrested. Any man dressed in women's clothing was arrested. All sorts of shit. Yeah. A lot of these people, like a lot of these people were uh, ex-army or like ex-military and they were cross-dressers. And so like the only ID that they had was their male military ID. Yeah. Um, Really upsetting. Yeah. As the riots uh, broke out at around 120 in the morning, Marsha heard about the riots and she went to go and find her friend Sylvia, who was sleeping on a bench at the time. There were a few accounts and official records attributing Marsha to the shot glass heard around the world at, to start the riot. But according to Marsha's own account, she didn't even show up with Sylvia and ra- until around 2 a.m. this oh, night. Okay. By that time, the police had already sl- set Stonewall Inn on fire. Wow. The next night, Marsha was there. She climbed up a lamp post during the riots and she dropped a brick onto a police windshield, mm-hmm. shattering, <laughs> shattering it. We still love that. I know. It's great. You're still there. You're there. Because this is like a five-day thing, okay? Yeah. These riots were no joke. And I really, I'm going to talk about it tomorrow or whenever we, um, whenever our next episode is getting recorded. Oh, okay. But they were, they were just no joke. And mm-hmm. it really inspired a lot of people. So following the riots, Marsha joined an activist group called the Gay Liberation Front. Okay. This was the new passion, activism. People needed to be allowed to gather peacefully without fear of arrest or raid. This became a focus of the community at large and spent the next year creating safe spaces. Mm -hmm. The following year on the anniversary of Stonewall, Marsha took part in the Christopher Street Liberation Day March, Mm -hmm. which is what would go on to become known as the Pride Parade. Pride Parade. 
Mm -hmm. At this March, the organizations scheduled a series of four dances to be held at NYU's Weinstein Hall as dance affairs. Okay. This would help them raise money, help these students and people in the community to raise money for legal, medical, and housing services for just the gay community in the area. Love that. Okay. NYU's inside Greenwich Village as well. Oh, okay. So like that it's a it's a very local thing. Yeah. Later in that year, in August of 1970, she Marcia staged a sit-in at NYU after the administrators canceled those dances. Rude. Rude. Over the course of that five-day sit-in, Marcia and Sylvia came up with an idea. Were they canceled like because they were because they were they were gay LGBT affiliated? Okay. Mm-hmm. Because they were affiliated with that community, they weren't appropriate anymore. Jesus. At NYU, wow. Yeah. Well, it's still the late six. It's it's yeah. No, I know. But it's just, I know my brain is like, damn. I know it's crazy. But this is the That's start of it. Like we ago. we are able to think that that is so fucking crazy because these people did that stuff that was so fucking crazy. Yeah. So uh, that we could like think. fifty years. Yeah. That's not that long. <laughs> it's not that long that we've been considered humans. Yeah. Over the course of the five-day sit-in, Marsha and Sylvia came up with an idea. There should be a home set up for the non-conforming youth of that area. Yeah, there should. Thus was born STAR. Okay. Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. I love that. Yeah. This was originated as a radical political collective that also provided housing and support to homeless LGBT youth and sex workers in the lower Manhattan area. Okay. Sylvia and Johnson were the mothers of the house and funded it through all through their own sex work, which they worked a lot. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Marsha was offered the position like when they were coming up with this idea, uh, Sylvia was like, Marsha, you should be president of this. And she Mm -hmm. turned it down because she believed someone with a more linear brain would be much better at running it. Okay. Um, And we're going to get a lot more into star in two episodes um, that's two from now. Oh, okay. So there was one big issue with this plan. Um, Sylvia and Marsha were both homeless themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, Star was for the street gay people, the street homeless people, and anybody that needed help out at that time. So, Marsh, uh, quote, Marsha and I had always sneaked people into our hotel rooms. Marsha and I decided to get a building. We were trying to get away from the mafia's control at the bars, end quote. Yeah. Sometimes they would sneak up to 50 people into a room at a time. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Just for a place to shower, to lay down. Yeah. That's not the street. Marsha and Sylvia held a dance fundraiser in November of 1970, and they were able to raise the funds to buy a four-bedroom apartment with no electricity or heat. Jeez. But they got it. Yeah. And they worked tirelessly to repair it, and they housed as many youths as they could there, even while they were working on it, selling themselves to prevent the children from having to do the same. Mm-hmm. Sadly, this house was only active for a few months. It closed down in July 71. Jeez. One of the big issues of the early LGBT com- LGBTQ movement was that there was very little recognition towards trans people and language in writing in support for equality. And again, I'm going to delve a lot more into this part specifically when we talk about Sylvia in two episodes and the issues of the early feminist movement. They were just to be short, they were real judgmental bitches. Right. Yeah. There were no laws protecting trans youth. And 1972 saw the end of meetings for Star. By 1973, the movement died at the parades when Marsha, Sylvia and other drag queens were told to stay at the back of the parade. (sighs) The lesbians running the event said that the transgenders gave the movement a bad name. So Marsha and Sylvia marched out in front of the whole damn thing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that one is going to make me real fucking angry when I'm talking about it. So like, uh, yeah, yeah, we're going to get a lot more into that in Sylvia. And I'm actually like, these are the episodes I 
have fucking loved learning about. I've loved writing about them. Like the, yeah. I'm really excited about these guys. It's just like actively just everything that these two people had done and started. And then like three years later, told to get to the back of the parade because they made it look bad. Like well, I, they helped start that community. Are those lesbians still alive? Because I want to fight them. <laughs> right? Like, Can I go punch a lesbian in the face for being a dick? Yeah, like a senior citizen lesbian. I'm going to go punch her in the face. I'm not. I will do it. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it's ridiculous. <sighs> that is... Judgmental uh, bitches. Yeah, that's really upsetting to me. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like it's under your skin and just yeah. Ugh, God, I wish I had something more eloquent to say, and I'm sure that people besides me have said it way more eloquently in the past. But just like it really does, I feel like a really deep anger in the base of my throat. I'm furious about that story. <laughs> You're gonna be real angry when we talk about it more. It's it, <sighs> The whole idea, like, behind the mentality of transgender people, like, it just makes me so angry. And so we're, and we're really, we're going to get into that in two episodes. Um, yeah. Because, and it, when we talk about Sylvia, because uh, I feel like that's, there's so many, there's so many things in Marsha's life that are worth talking about. And these other two big deals, the Stonewall riots, and then the, mm-hmm. you know, the LGBTQ community. Yeah creating a movement outside of that. I think those are two very specific, important topics, but we don't have enough time today. So I'm going to put them in other, right. other episodes. It's just, it's, it's upsetting to me how I was surprised to hear this story. Cause like, uh, the, the pride circles, at least that I move in now and like the gay people and the people in that umbrella that I speak to, like, love Marsha and look up to Marsha and things like that. And, um, and I know that there are definitely like turfs that don't, but like just the circles that I move in do. And so (laughs) then to like, be like, wow, this person that we really, that I truly look up to was treated so poorly Yeah, at a thing that they created. They were it. They (laughs) started that shit. Like, are you kidding me? It's, we will get to it. Right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just sorry, everyone. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, fuck that. Anyway. All right. During this whole time and for the rest of her fucking life, Marsha would suffer from periodic mental breaks. Mm-hmm. Her health worked in a multi-month cycle. So we're going to start with healthy, Mar- healthy Marsha, happy Marsha. Okay. Um, Healthy Marsha, happy Marsha. She is living her best life. She's happy. She's doing her work. She's got her causes. She has the energy to be happy and healthy. Then she gets depressed and really stressed because I, and I would imagine at this time it is, you know, the seventies and eighties and people still fucking hate transgender people. And so it's stressful just existing there and also being a sex worker for survival on top of that. Like none of that is an environment for a healthy person. Mm -hmm. So she'd get depressed. She'd get stressed. She would have a break. She'd switch into Malcolm Mm -hmm. and then become really violent. She would get arrested at bars. She would be, you know, she would be found walking down the street, buck ass naked, like wow, just crazy, crazy stuff. Um, and so authorities would bring her in. She, they kind of, they knew, and then they would take her to a mental health facility, pump her full, full of chlorpromazine. Okay. Which is very big sedative and keep her there for two to three months at a time. Wow. Right. So during this whole time, friends would hear about it. You know, Marsh is in jail again. Marsh is in the, you know, in Bellevue oh, again. Sorry, I had to look up the brand name of that medication. <laughs> I was like, wait, what is it? It's Thorazine. Okay. Thorazine, yeah. So it's going to put you down. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
you know, every time this would happen, her friends would find out. They'd be like, all right, Marsh is in Bellevue again. We got to get bail money. We got to, you know, we got to be able to, like, raise money to get her actually out wow. in into the real world. Yeah. So then she would get out. And then for the next month or so, the meds would slowly wear off and she would kind of come back to being herself and then back to happy Marsha and healthy Marsha. Wow. So it would take this, I mean, it would take s- months and months at a time. Yeah. Like four or five months out of her life. They're like, yeah. and depending on how stressful those cycles are, like it can go back in immediately or yeah. it can go, you know, or it can take a while. Like you might, you know, maybe she had really good run for like a year and, because she was in a good place. She was in a supportive area or whatever. And then yeah. it just would, something would snap. Wow. Yeah. So during this time, she was also a member of multiple drag shows. I'm going to, I've, I'm trying to be open with all of the people that we talk about in talking about like the things that make them famous people, the things that make them happy people, the, you know, fun things, that yeah. they do. but I also try to be really open about when they have issues. And yeah. the truth is that Marsha had major issues in yeah. her life. That was something that she always, always struggled with. And it, you know, it's, it's just, it was, it was part of being Marsha. Right. Well, you don't live the life that Marsha lived uh, and have zero issues. And so like, it makes, like that is part of what makes them themselves. And so like, it makes sense that we would cover it, but, yeah. but also doing shows. Yes. Performing. So yeah. And on, so the positive side, happy Marsha, healthy Marsha would go and be part of the community again. She would get at, you know, she would be active in different things. And so she was a member of multiple drag shows. Yeah. She played as the gypsy queen with the angels of light in 1973 and was most known for being part of a troupe called the hot peaches from 1972 all the way up until her death in 92. Oh, wow. That's a long time. Yeah. She was, she was very frequent performer there. Okay. She continued. Hot peaches. Yes. Love it. Peaches. <laughs> she continued on in her activism for the rest of her life. She became involved with the ACT UP movement of the 80s and early 90s, which is for AIDS. Oh, okay. And during that time, she lived with a friend who said that he invited her in one night when it was 10 degrees outside. That is cold. Cold motherfucking night. Yeah to not have a place to guarantee you're going to be safe and warm. Yeah. To not have walls. <laughs> and she was very far from the only one that was surviving that way. Yeah. Every fucking night. Wow. It's just insane. So while we mostly know Marsha for her caring nature and her activism, the period of Marsha Malcolm <laughs> had really lasting consequences. It was very damaging to her. And mm-hmm. It, and more so, unfortunately, it had ramifications in the community. So by the end of her life, she had actually been permanently banned from most bars in Greenwich Village. Wow. Yeah. Like it was it was that much of a problem because when you're having stuff like if you're if, if you're fucking having a breakdown in your own safe home, like that's one thing. But she didn't have a home. Her life was clubs. It was bars. It was drag shows it was the street outside and so when she's having these breakdowns in these very public places they have ramifications that are outside of her and lasting consequences so she just wasn't welcome um she had a temper and a tendency to get into fights and at the end of the day she was a large black man (laughs) with a very good punch oh wow yeah like that's the truth of it right Yes. It's crazy. Um, one of the issues that we will get into in the Sylvia episode, like I said, is the kind of fear that drag queens and trans people instilled in the official gay movement. And they have, to this day, been fighting to get just a smidgen of acceptance in this community. Yeah. But it cannot be overstated how insulting it must have been to work so hard to be accepted into gay bars, to fight alongside gays and lesbians, just to have them immediately turn their backs because it would be delegitimize your movement. Yeah. But here's where a small line of it is relevant. Mental illness is a bitch, really big bitch. Yeah. 
And even if you didn't grow up in an abused home, even if you did grow up in the most accepting environment and do not have PTSD of some sort or any trauma to speak of, the fact is and was then that if you hear you're fucked up for long enough, often enough, you will start to think that you must be fucked up. Yeah. And part of that is being told that your very existence is not valid. Yeah. That is a traumatic thing to hear. Yeah. Marsha was in the former category. Uh, She had a traumatic childhood that ended up on the streets engaging in survival sex Mm -hmm. and the sex work to provide for countless youth. This took a toll on her, which brings us back to the cycle she had of kind of breaking down and getting committed and relapsing back in, you know, kind of getting back to normal. Right. She had a lot of mental health shit, but she and Sylvia had this promise to each other, Mm -hmm. no matter what. And that was that they were going to cross the River Jordan together. That's what they called the Hudson River. Basically, when they died, they were going to go together. Okay. Yeah. Which is why... There were a lot of mixed reactions when her body was found washed ashore a couple weeks after Pride 1992. Of course, at this point, nobody official gave a single shit about a cross-dressed body washed ashore. Police ruled it easily as a suicide, Mm -hmm. despite all of her friends' objections. They thought, even though they all noticed her mental deterioration, none of them ever, ever, ever thought that it would take the form of suicide. That was just not the way that Marsha worked. Mm -hmm. So others in the area came forward to share that they witnessed Marsha getting harassed by some thugs in the area. Her death was considered suspicious for years by people in the community until finally in 2002, the cause Mm -hmm. of death was changed from suicide to undetermined. And then it, took another 10 years before officials finally opened the case into a possible homicide. Wow. Yeah. When Marsha's ashes were scattered in the Hudson River, respectfully, police shut down 7th Avenue to allow mourners to have some space. Mm-hmm. That's like, okay. You're so kind. Yeah, I mean, like... You don't give a you. shit about us. But yeah, you're so fucking kind. Wow. That's Marsha. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. There's our title. <laughs> I've been waiting for you to say it all fucking episode. I've been holding back. Good. So <laughs> light. But yeah. Wow. I'm sure we'll like touch back. Marsha's going to kind of come back. In, yeah. Marsha will come back in with um, a lot with Sylvia there. They were besties their whole life. Yeah. Um, well, Marsha's whole adult life. Mm-hmm. So that's, she's going to come back in. We'll hear from her again. Mm-hmm. And um, next week, we're going to talk about the woman that actually started the Stonewall riots. Okay. Yeah. We will see y'all then as we continue our pride series. Woo-hoo. I'm really glad that we're doing these. Yeah. This is good. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. All right. Um, Take care of yourselves. Drink your water. Take medications that you're supposed to be taking. All that jazz. Don't be afraid of addressing your mental health needs. Yeah. Do all that. All right. All right. Love y'all. Have a good week. Bye. Bye.